episode five should just be called Holy Shit because we started reading the outline and just went, Holy Shit. Doing lots of dragon strafe runs, burning most of the set. We set fire to 22 people twice. We've been doing many burns, amputees, mutilated bodies. We had three motion control rigs going, spider cam. Our King's Landing set is around about 650 extras. We had three units going and now at the end, four. We've been just slammed since day one. Big telescopic cranes, up to nine cameras. It was off the scale, really, in every way. And then we saw the set and what Deb Riley and her team was building, and we just said, wow, this is amazing. King's Landing traditionally has been Dubrovnik. The thing about Dubrovnik is it's a really beautiful city, and they love it, and they don't want us to, you know, burn it down. We've had this area out the back of the office. It's been there for, you know, since we ever started here. It's so close and so easy, and Belfast needs a backlot. Why don't we just call this a backlot and build this set for real? There's no such thing as a set you can just walk onto and shoot when you're planning on destroying it. And there was so much thought that went into every single section because it had so many requirements. While we were designing the buildings, we were designing the destruction at the same time. So for every lovely drawing of plans and elevations of the building, we had lovely plans and elevations of the buildings destroyed. It's not just a set that it stands there and people walk in and out. I mean, it goes through all these changes. We're going to see the plaza and Main Street all on fire. In order to supply all the flames, each building has its own manifold system. It gets broken up into many, many different pipes to each window or doorway or roof. It's all kind of steel and hoses and cryogenic hoses and valves and normal valves and two-ton gas tanks, three-ton gas tanks, five-ton gas trucks. It makes for a heavily propane-filled set. There wasn't a lot of time up our sleeve that we could take weeks to change the set over into a destructive stage. So Tom Martin, our construction manager, came up with the genius idea of building the set in its destroyed stage first and then cladding it so that it was perfect to begin with. No crew member that wasn't there during the build process had any idea that the destroyed version was sitting underneath waiting to be revealed. I took a little video for, of, for myself on my phone of the back streets, not even the main drag, the lanes, the, the offshoots, and the aged doors with tear stains of rust running down them. It absolutely looks like it's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So there's loads of details. There's the cornices and pillars and friezes, corbels all over the set. There's been a lot of scenic sculpture. We did a quite large uh, relief plaque with uh, the letter D quite prominent, you know, both Dan and David. So we had two of them, obviously. From a set deck perspective, Deb wanted it off, off, an authentic sort of place, so the shop fronts, you know, in the colour palette, all the doors, all the studs, you know, all that sort of detail. We wanted as real as possible. It's shocking when you go behind one of these doors and you see scaffolding, because you really think you're in these places. <laughs> Nikolai and I said the other day, we'll never be on anything that is this vast ever again. They've built Croatia, and not like a street. They've built like 17 streets and alleys. It has its drawbacks because it's right in the middle of the city. The King's Landing set was sprawling within Belfast within view of a number of raised buildings. We had an unprecedented number of drones, paparazzi attention, people just following the show around and trying to get a sneak peek. What we didn't want them to see was get the view looking down the King's Landing street so we stuck up a five-high container wall, and that problem died down pretty quick after that. One of the great things about going to Dubrovnik was there was a reality there that it was impossible to recapture with a set. And, and this year, Deb recaptured that reality with the set. It felt like you were wandering through Dubrovnik, but we were in Belfast. We were in a parking lot across from the Harlan and Wolf cranes. It was just, you know, her crowning achievement. Three, three, Charlie, take three, email. Three, two, one, action. There's something you need to know. Someone's betrayed me. Yes. We enter into five 
with a broken Danny. John Snow. Clarence. He knows the truth about John. He does. Because you told him. If John hadn't told her the truth, if Cersei hadn't betrayed her, if Cersei hadn't executed Day, if all these things had happened in any different way, then I don't think we'd be seeing this side of Daenerys Targaryen. I, Daenerys of House Targaryen, sentence you to die. What? The Tyrion betrayed Varys? Tyrion is responsible for Varys' execution? They're best of friends. Not really. There's other things at play here. It was me. He has to betray somebody, right? It's a choice between betraying your best friend or your queen, and, and he chooses to remain loyal to his queen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just chilling with the harmony, babe. That was really nice. They were the harmonizing. Okay, here we go, guys. Shooting. Sea marker. Action. It was scripted that he puts his hand up to touch Faris. What Connolith did that was that I really, really liked is his reaction, which was shock. He did that this one time, and I said to him, why, why did you do that? He said, well, he's never been touched before. And it was cool, and it was just suddenly like, wow, OK, that, I mean, it made lots of sense. It was like suddenly he was being touched, and he, this is not a man who's ever been touched. Well, it was one of the first scenes we shot. We got to a certain point, and then it started raining, and it started pouring, and then basically the only time I've ever been on Thrones where we got shut down because it was torrential rain. And then we went back and we reshot the wides of that scene, and then we realised that we owed all the parts from one side where you have the dragon behind you. So basically, it was shot over seven months, and each time, you know, poor Conlith had to kind of show up again. Barris had to just stand there going, OK, I guess I'm dying again. Dracarys. We thought it was important in the siege of King's Landing that the good guys not be good guys anymore, and that the, the lines between good and bad and right and wrong get erased. We mirrored a lot of the Battle of the Bastards shots, but instead of having the Boltons be the invading army, we had the Allied troops. There's a shot that pulls up behind John and reveals the Bolton army for the first time in Battle of the Bastards. We do the same thing, but from behind the leader of the mercenary group. What we need to understand as an audience is that these people have come here for blood. series of shots is the moment that the King's Landing gate is obliterated by dragon fire. It's covered by eight cameras, one explosion over all of these camera views. Each camera view is carrying the explosion further. The complexity of breaking not only the gate but destroying the wall, wiping out the people, getting the fire element you know, big enough to travel as we needed it to. Then there was this whole series of live action components. Harry Strickland's uh, horse that gets annihilated. Three, two, one, action! A real gold company and digital gold company. Jump straight in, mate. Get your arm right up into your shoulder. That's it. Do you want to close down, mate? Okay. We trained them the same as we trained the Unsullied, but just changed a few of their drill movements to define them from being Unsullied. Rolling! Stand still! Then there was a half-scale gate build by Sam Conway. The half-scale gate explosion. We've been building out of um, like basically biscuit foam and balsa. We're going to be blasting it out of the way with uh, with many air mortars. Three, two, one. So basically, what well, the idea is to achieve a 60-foot explosion coming out of the um, centre of the, of the gate and also some flame bangs too. You know, it was a lot of planning for production and a lot of work for Sam, and now it's a lot of work for us. Don't fall on him. Don't drop the fire extinguisher on his head. <laughs> As 
as the dragons have gotten bigger, they've been lighting more and more people on fire. And I believe, I believe this year, one of the things that Riley brought to the table was the most people that have ever been burned on screen for a production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good with that? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, if you haven't done this before. That's the director just locking my head off. He doesn't know what he's doing. I wish he wouldn't touch it. <laughs> the 22 burn is actually 44 burns. Um, it's two halves, and five of the 22 were full burns but with no masks. When the, the time comes and the call is given, there's a process of getting them ready. They're all wearing two mil wetsuits covered with three layers of Nomex race underwear soaked in Zell gel. On top of that is a race suit, covered with a boiler suit, and then a costume. And then they have silicon masks on and gloves on. And what we essentially did was we lit the five guys manually, and then we, we detonated um, 17 Tamars, which are basically um, gas camping canisters inside metal cages, and they create a 15-foot fireball. Three, two, one, action. 17 poppers go off amongst all the, the four fire jobs, yeah? Then, three, two, one, action, everybody reacts forward. The full burns go on the A of action, the partials go on shun, these guys go after I've finished saying the word action. OK, so we get a tiny ripple effect. We'll do a rehearsal. When he first lit me up, my trousers are quite baggy, so they've spritzed me with IPA, so there's some fumes in there. <laughs> I'm bending over, and they lit me, and it just went... <clears throat> I thought, that's, that's hot, I'm hot already, and we've not even started to count down yet. We're rolling, guys, rolling, rolling. Have a good one, boys. Three, two, one, action! Three, two, one! We had up to nine cameras covering that scene. It's an extraordinary sensation as well, filming it. You know it's fiction, but to see that many men on fire, I found quite distressing at times. I remember the smell. It's horrifying. Help! 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 and then we put them all out. So for, for 22 people, we had 22 other people with fire extinguishers, plus another six people with fire extinguishers backing all of that up. So it's a big deal. Three, two, one, fire! We have our initial destruction, which is the dragon comes in, blows shit up, says very clearly, this isn't going to end well for you. In come the Allied forces, and they take out the Lannisters. And the audience go, yeah. Once the Lannisters surrender and the gates have been blown open and the Golden Company has been dispersed, the battle's over. And John feels like that's quite clear. They did it. They did the impossible. This is a bloodless coup. It's out of Cersei's hands. You cut to Cersei, you see her, you cut to Tyrion, realizing this is an opportunity. This is the moment where the bells can ring. And we can call all this off. And then you go to Danny. She feels empty. It wasn't what she thought it was. It's not enough. Every single thing that's led her to this point, and there she is, alone. We've all got this part of us, that part that goes, I'm going to put that chocolate cake down, and I'm going to walk away. We come up against those moral conundrums all the time. I'm not saying chocolate cake is a moral conundrum. Eat as much fucking cake as you want. But those things that you wrestle with in yourself. She knows she has won this war. It's in that moment when she makes the decision to make this personal. It's one of my favorite Amelia performance moments because it took place on the back of like a giant green dragon buck without a real thing anywhere in sight. Amelia's really nice and she cares. She's a whole bunch of things that Danny isn't. So reaching this part of Danny is a was a tough call for her. Ultimately she is who she is, and that's a Targaryen. And you know, she has said repeatedly throughout the show, I will take what is mine with fire and blood. And in this episode she does it. For the audience, oh you wanted a battle, well here you go. Drogon's fire blasting does a lot of damage. I mean, it's not Godzilla, but we're heading that direction. Uh, we create a lot of um, interactive light for Dragonfire. So that can either be a series of large flame bars, or it can be a pyrotechnic charge that will light up. 
course then what happens is we take, we go back to the studio and then we do it uh, with the VFX MoCo cameras. We had the, the big flamethrower on the spider cam on stage that was shooting, you know, 40 feet of fire. And then we do also the impacting on the ground. We do that as a half-scale model shoot pyrotechnic charge that goes along. these things get tied in together so you'll see the dragon fire chasing those flames and then where the dragon fire lands you'll see all the pyrotechnic charges going off. The place when she takes off and starts burning the city and when the Unsullied on the ground and the Northmen on the ground take that as their cue that anything goes. That should be enough, guys, but it's not. Just up ahead, everyone looking up, you can see the dragon coming down, and it fires on the city. And go Grey World. There's a moment when we see Grey Worm attacking out his enemies when there's no need to do that. The way we described him in the screenplay was that he's become almost an angel of death. He's just gone back to being like this kind of traumatized robot. There are a lot of people lurking in the background. Let's see if you can find Aaron Rodgers. I was helping a woman who was injured uh, set her down, and then the hell with her. I'm getting out of there. So struggle, struggle, and then there's struggle that we need to Uh Guys, one thing. The beheading came from the idea to take the audience to a place where they felt that they shared the bloodlust of the Stark, so they wanted to see these people get creamed and then to give them what they wanted and show them with no mercy the horrors of war. And at that face-off, in that moment, you're with John more than anybody else. Interestingly, when we were editing it, there was a mistake made at the moment that it goes to slow motion. And Sam Carton was like, oh. And suddenly I was riveted. And that nothing letting me off the hook from seeing what he's seeing and experiencing what he's experiencing. And there's a great shot that Miguel got. You just have the Lannister soldier who's, who's guiding the civilians of King's Landing to safety. And the good guy in this shot is a guy in bad guy armor. And the bad guys in this shot are the ones who are doing all of these horrific things. If three was the final battle between good and evil, five is what have we become? It's all got a bit bleak, hasn't it? It's quite bleak. This, this season's really bleak. <laughs> <laughs> if I win, I'll bring your head to Cersei so you can kiss her one last time. <laughs> Finally, after 15 years of being colleagues, I've given two days to kick his ass. The time for gentleman-like fights are over. The idea was it was a slugfest. It's gonna be very funny for Denmark because two of their actors are gonna fight it off. The Dane Bowl. <laughs> It's a little bit disconcerting when they start talking Danish to each other because I'm not sure whether they're, they're changing a move or conspiring to do something that we don't want them to do. Where we did it, it was a very unfriendly environment, which was big rocks and stones and a tide. This very, you know, very small cove where the tide came in and out, and it was wet and sandy. Those guys being soaking wet and having sand everywhere. They're probably still finding sand in the bath now. Euron is a psychopath. A normal person would not swim to shore just so he could murder one other person. He wants to know what new things are like. As he says with Cersei, life can be boring. The ultimate new interesting experience he's never had before is death, and I think he's 
strangely excited about having that experience as well, and he dies with a smile on his face. That was the first thing I asked Dan and David is, am I dead? And they go like, no, maybe, a little. But I go like, no, I don't think so. It struck us that it would be apocalyptically beautiful to see them fighting on the stairway to nowhere with the sky in the background and the dragon flying by and the flames everywhere. And it's just pretty epic and that's what we wanted. Hello, big brother. One more on this time, guys. And we shot this thing for days and days and days, and it was so hard to shoot, and it was a massive set that was a 72 steps. The really important thing for me in designing the staircase was that it felt brand. We've always seen these computer-generated uh, illustrations of King's Landing, and there is a big tower uh, down the side of the big keep. The problem with a staircase is it will want to go up. So I think the first time in, in our kind of history of building things here, we've actually hit the grid of the stages. There's a lot of crew, and it's just the one staircase, so trying to get cameras into positions right up against the staircase, it's been quite difficult. At the same time, the building is, is being ruined by the dragon fire, so there's crumbling walls everywhere. Um, special effects will be dropping rocks and sand and debris. Um, so there's all these kind of interesting challenges, as well as running in and, and fighting and, and falling down the stairs. So when you attack, it's better that you're slower but on target and he gets out of the way, rather than trying to be really fast and deliberately missing, because we'll see a deliberate miss. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just slow and deliberate. Right. Everybody, uh, and, and three, two, one, action. Oh! And the way we tackled it was, we put one very big crane on the inside of the, the circle, on the inside of the staircase, which could reach any point on that staircase. And then where the staircase has been destroyed at the back, we put another crane on a large rostrum so we could shoot both ways. When we're on the staircase, we shoot a whole combination of handheld, and then we deploy our Artemis Maxima, which is this handheld stabilized rig. <laughs> We learn the choreography, we get the trust of the uh, actors and vice versa. And if you learn it well enough, you can step inside that zone with the swords going over the camera or under the camera. Before you know it, you know, it gets pretty exciting. Yeah, that fight was brutal. It's brutal to watch, but it's brutal to shoot as well because for Hafthor, he's wearing so many prosthetics. Hafthor had to wake up at midnight to get ready for an 8 a.m. call. Seven and a half hours of makeup, um, and then he had to do a 10 hour day. They were, they were hard, they were hard, hard work. When we read the scripts, we realized that there's this big reveal. And another step, ah, oh, fuck it, just pull it off. So the last time we'd really seen Mountain from the hands of our work was season four. He was lying on the slab and he had this whole rotted kind of ulcerated area on the side of his torso. So that was really the, the only springboard we had to the design. They kept referring to him as um, Franken Mountain. And we just came up with this kind of putrid, almost porcelain looking, it was this Frankensteinian looking figure. Hapthor won World's Strongest Man this year. We got him really late because of that as well. So we basically used his strength to throw Rory's character around, and he had a really big day where literally he spent the whole day being thrown into walls. This isn't a trained stuntman. This is a guy that smashes stuff up. And three, two, one, smack him against the wall. Cut. Rory was like, I mean, sometimes we thought he was dying on the stairs in between takes, literally. <coughs> Everyone okay? For a big man, you're very gentle. <gasps> I, after a couple of days, decided to have a, to, I brought Hapthor in and I gave him this a box with a sandbag on top of it, and I put the camera underneath him. We didn't, well, there was no reason to shoot it. And I was just like, I just want you to just 
When I say action, just fucking smash that as hard as you possibly can. Pretend it's Rory's head. And looking right at the camera. And, and he was just like going <laughs> like that when shooting in slow motion. Three, two, one, and action. And one more time. And three, two, one, and action. Great. And now this time, just. And I just got all his anger out so that it was all done, and then we went off and did the scene. <laughs> We're going to do a 30 foot fall where Jula takes off Mike, the stunt double for the mountain, um, into a box ring. For two really big guys and one of them going off backwards in you know, full prosthetics, it's getting the wall right that's the difficult bit, is because we, you know it's meant to be like four foot thick. It will be a couple of feet thick, but it's trying to get that to look right. There are many times when we're planning a season and you know you kind of have to avoid giving the audience exactly what they want because then things start to become predictable. This is a case where we wanted the same thing. We've always wanted to see these two face off and they finally did. Ready, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Yep. Here we go. You needed a perspective to carry you through this horror. We thought Aria was the best person to use for that purpose. I got a call from Miguel. Basically, was like, I can't tell you anything, but you know what we did in Bob? I was like, yeah. He was like, we're going to do that, but with you. And I was like, OK. It was meant to be ultimately come across as a seven and a half minute non-stop shot where we follow her on the run. We practiced this many, many times. We've spent a whole day, two days, practicing this shot already with Aria and with all the stunt team and all the extras we require. Little boy, back, down the stairs, round. Gonna really throw away the girl coming out the window. That's me. 69 apple cake, six, million frames. Three, two, one, action! From a camera perspective, it took us an hour to figure out how we're going to move the camera. It's all the other stuff that goes on in the background, you know, and we've got a great special effects crew who, you know, put in smoke and flame bars and lots of extras. <laughs> Every single extra you look at will have each of their stories. So, you know, I think that's what makes those one us so intense. So I think definitely when you came in here, that thing, the first time I looked around, said, fuck, I'm fucked. I'm fucked unless I get out of it. How do I get out of it? Kill this way. We've got all sorts of air mortars going off. <laughs> and she gets picked up by the crowd. Oh! And she is just cannon fodder because Danny is bombing the city. <laughs> I've decided on this journey to a new life and I might not even make it out of the gates. We want the audience to think that she's dead for like a second, but audiences are too smart for that. There's an element of luck in these things as well. You know, we need all, everybody to get a little bit lucky at the same time. We're setting people on fire during it and putting them out during it. If I miscue it, or not cue it quick enough, it doesn't work. There's any number of things that can just make the take not as good as you would hope it to be. And they typically take 10 takes to get. Delta mark, 48 frames. Bravo, 69, delta take, one on the end. Um. journey that Arya is taking, heavily inspired by the firebombing of Dresden, because what it needs to look like is the firebombing of King's Landing. It was interesting to us that we could we could take a modern reference and map it onto a, a pre-modern situation, because we have air firepower in the form of the dragons. <laughs> You see some of the photographs, the terrifying photographs of not just the level of destruction, but you know, there's people walking to work the next day with decapitated heads lying on the ground. It's like it's a terrifying, terrifying thing. She's seen some awful things, but this is like mass destruction and it's pretty sickening even for the strongest of people. 
We've been doing many full body burns, some with negative space, and some crushed, sort of mutilated bodies. Extras, which are amputees, and we've created severed limbs. So we've had a team of about five, six people on a day-to-day -day basis. And on some days, Miguel will say, right, I need these guys to have some head injuries. This guy's got his throat slashed. This guy's gonna be really badly burnt. So suddenly our guys just pile in and we've just got this big jigsaw puzzle of pieces that we've got in our arsenal and fortunately it seems to have worked out. Now I've got one of my girls walking along and she's got a handful of intestines and we've got amputees, bless them. And then you make the ends of the limbs that they have look horrible and then you make trails of blood where they meant to have thing and then and they're screaming horribly. <laughs> When they cut, someone's walking around with a box of ice lollies and going, um, do you want an ice lolly? And it's like, no, I'm all right. What we do for a living is a bit, it's a bit surreal at times, you know. It was originally shot to be this really long wonder, and it was actually a decision that Miguel and his editor Tim Porter made as they were cutting it, that intercutting the Clegane Bowl and, and Arya's escape was actually much more emotional and effective than having this 12 minute long wonder and then the fight is two separate pieces. All she's left with is the sound of burning people and the smell of burning flesh. And she sees a white horse because it's symbolic and beautiful. And then she hops on and gallops off and makes it out of the city. The at Echo Tick One. <gasps> A, B, and C come on boards. D marker. It's a kind of genuine discovery as she goes along. Each step she takes, something crumbles, something falls, the destruction's unavoidable. She loses people and finds herself totally alone. The thing that he has with his sister, which is absolute unconditional love. <laughs> she came back for me. Of course I did. He goes back to her, even though he knows that she's going to die. He goes back to her, even though she, he knows that she'll never surrender. He goes back to her just to be there for her. He almost goes back to her, I would say, to prove that he was never going to leave. The skull room, unfortunately, had to be recreated because in order to destroy the space, we had to build it. And then a lot of bricks were, were brought in for it. And we had some big architectural pieces made as well. The great thing was I had all of the information about the space. We had already uh, measured it and drawn it. I had all of the photographs of it. One of the lessons that I learned very quickly was a pile of rubble isn't very interesting unless you have identifiable architectural pieces that, uh, that can sit in it and an audience can identify with having fallen from that building. The escape route is blocked and there is no way out. And now we're talking seconds and, uh, and she's panicking. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. I don't want to die. Take me, please. Look, look me in the eye. Don't go away. Please don't let me die. I'm not like this. Look at me. There's a helplessness for, from both of them and a sense of loss that is the strangest feeling to experience with them because, you know, Cersei is one of the most horrendous characters committed to film. And yet somehow at the end she's just a girl and she's just scared and, and he's there to comfort her. Just look at me. I don't want to touch. Nothing else matters. Just us. Only us. 